Hi friends, welcome again to another episode of Beyond the Clouds, Edge to Edge Transformation. And when we talk about transformation, it's often tempting to go into a second universe, a third universe, when we haven't even seen the universe that's around us. We haven't even deeply looked into it and how nuanced it is. So this is the kind of stuff Dr. Prasanthapal is working on, how to help us unfold the truth that is right here manifesting in front of us. Prasanthada, tell us a little bit about your story. How did you become this Prasant so obsessed with details and understanding of reality as it is presenting in front of us? Thank you, Shankar, for the beautiful introduction. It was literally like a slippery slope and that lubricant was the curiosity. If you're a curious individual intrinsically and then start poking around things and me being a physicist by training helps. And then I just keep poking things around and sometimes ask very stupid question, but that can once in a while be very fundamental in nature. And then you start seeing the unraveling process. So then you see all the different colorful and beautiful realities that is out there, but we often don't perceive. And, and that's what led me to what I'm doing right now is the unfolding of information, unfolding of structure in apparently nuanced and extremely pedagogical reality. All this is music to my ears, and it's amazing. Tell us a little bit about what you did earlier, the mental GPS. Uh, I think I saw a snapshot of that on CBS 60 Minutes. What is that about? Well, having grown up in an ashram in India helps to be curious about our inner nature. And then I have had the privilege to work with uh, world famous psychiatrists like Jad Brewer and having the opportunity to build an fMRI-based biofeedback systems and then successfully exiting a company that was founded on those principles of navigating your mind using scientific data. That's what I've been doing. But then I realized that just the data on the face of it is just not good enough. There is a lot more going on under the hood. It's like if you have a glass of water, if you see transparent water, but if you go deeper, you will see the hydrogen and the oxygen atom. And that's the process that makes you curious about like, oh my God, what is apparent is not what it is underlying. And similar things are happening with our mental states that through sensors and through imaging, and luckily we are living in a generation where technology is kind of at its pinnacle. So we should leverage the existing technology like AI, machine learning, big data, communications, everything has come to a point where we can start investigating what is happening inside our brain. And pretty much the way a GPS helps to find ourselves in an unknown city. Similarly, if there is a cue to the, the mental processing, how our mood and emotion and how we function is given in a scientifically sensible manner, then our life will be easier because we can see another dimension, dimension of ourselves, like just like the physical dimension, we can see the mental dimensions. And I believe that that will also lead to another revolution, which I call NI, which is the neural intelligence. We should be like a pair with the artificial intelligence and where AI will no longer be a threat, but rather it will be an augmentation process for our next human evolution, which is neural intelligence. This is truly remarkable that you're working on neural intelligence. What kind of a form factor will be needed to be able to see this? That's a great question. Uh, if you go to Wikipedia and see the first picture of a transistor, it used to fill the entire room, right? One single transistor would be like a building. And then slowly, slowly, everything turned into this guy, which he called like a mobile phone. Billions of transistors are packed together. So what you're seeing that as like bulky group of electrodes hanging around your head, it still shows the nascent form of the neurotechnology right now. But again, you have to start somewhere. Part of my mission is to replace as much as possible and do the same kind of scientific observation with minimal number of sensors and probes. And in an ideal world, it should be all devoid of those. 
so that even the small fluctuations around our mood and emotion, we should be able to detect just from, let's say, optical imaging through the, through the photon rays. Then we don't need any gadgets, but still we should be able to navigate how our brain and neuron works on a surface level. And if somebody needs to go deeper, then they can, of course, go deeper into fMRI and EEG kind of studies. But right now, at least I am able to see our breathing pattern without any kind of intervention. That is a first entry point. And then slowly, if we need more, we'll go more. That's truly remarkable. Now, we know that breath work or understanding the breath is related to the mood. Many yoga practices, many of the yin-yang practices are based on that. How has it helped people to be able to assess the breathing pattern and how can he self-regulate based on that? Well, pretty much like the GPS analogy that if you have a GPS, even if you lost your track, then how to correct your course. Similarly, just like there is good food and bad food, and if we eat bad food, we know the implications of that, that's the biofeedback we get. Similarly, breath is so fundamental and there is pattern to our breathing. The only problem right now is it is very hard, if not impossible to detect that. We have very crude markers like, let's say, breaths per second or per minute. It does not give us information about the evolution of the breathing, evolution of the cardiac pulses. If that becomes easily accessible, it will really revolutionize the way our human physiology, since the breath is a very fundamental gateway to our inner well-being that has been documented in every possible scriptures, pretty much across all the cultures. I believe that with the new technology of small signal processing, small signal processing is very tiny volume of information can lead to something very significant like breathing pattern and cardiac pulses. I believe that that will directly impact the way we look at ourselves, our body and mind, and that will help us in a very touch-free fashion to take control of some of our basic behavior. Are such technologies available today? And if so, at what price point? Well, right now, anything to talk about mental health, you generally get those like EEG devices, or like Muse from Interaction. There are like Breathwork, so many others, like they generally get, give you like a EEG basic, like alpha wave and beta wave that has been studied like very well for many years. The next generation of technology will be like giving like a much holistic picture. So those sensors give you like a very tiny fraction of what is going on inside you. The, the current technology has done a great job of showing us the connection between what is happening inside like a biophysiological marker. So we trust that it can only go better from there. I think it's just the tip of the iceberg right now. One of the pain points right now is that the neurological signal is so tiny, it's very hard to measure. And often we think it is unreliable. The moment we clean the data without losing the valuable information of the neurological patterns, then it will be very easy to model what is happening in our brain and as a correlate to our mental activities. Let's say I'm on a Zoom call and you can watch my breathing pattern using these devices. Could somebody misuse that information? The person is scared, now let's sell them insurance. Or the person is feeling excited, now let me sell a new Tesla. Could it be misused in these kinds of circumstances? That's a great question, Shankar. The, the question goes back to the fundamentals of is fire good or bad? Electricity good or bad? We know the answer. It all boils down to come up with effective protocols, effective legal framework that will help us use the fire without burning ourselves, use electricity without electrical short circuit. That's the whole thing happening around is AI good or bad. We just need responsible use of technology. We need to make sure that everything we are doing for human good, a better evolution of the human species. So that's why laws and the personal responsibility of the developers are happening. Some of the work being done at open AI, at least what they preach that the responsible use of AI. And similarly, there will be new regulations around responsible use of biometric data. That's where the things will happen. I see a lot of change in the legal framework of how we utilize that kind of data. At the end of the day, the human species also has to evolve with the evolution of the technology. It has to be like a moving target in terms of how we behave with the changing world of the technology. Otherwise, people will be falling behind and then there will be like a mismatch, which is already there, but I think we can do our best to make humanity evolve along with the technology. I've heard this from many researchers in AI saying that the biggest problem with AI today is not even the tools, 
is the data. If data is corrupted, if data is biased, it's going to give garbage in, garbage out. So what does your company do to cleanse the data, curate the data? Isn't there an inherent subjectivity when you're doing this kind of cleaning of the data? You kind of ask the only question that is relevant, which is, isn't there subjectivity to that? The answer is multifold, and I'll try to address those in as many ways as possible. It's a simple question on the face of it. But on the other hand, data has no meaning, literally no meaning, unless we have the ability to extract the information for a given context. Suppose you have a cardiac disease, and then anything related to the occurrence of this disease has to be extracted from everything else. Because when you measure a piece of data from like a physical reality, all kind of information is encoded there. Our ability to contextualize the data and then remove everything else and then pinpoint what is needed for that particular context is the pinnacle of data extraction or information extraction from raw data. The problem right now is how do we kill a cancer cell using chemotherapy without killing the good cells around it? And we know all the side effects that is happening. And exact same thing happening with the data cleaning. That in the name of cleaning, we sometimes try to massage it to make it look beautiful, like pleasing to the eyes at the cost of information loss. What we are doing fundamentally differently is how we can maximize the access to the information in the given context without minimizing everything else, without minimizing the quality of the information and the data that is underlying. So this is the basic difference between traditional data cleaning method where you are trying to make things smooth looking, beautiful looking. We are not trying to look at beautiful or ugly either. We are trying to extract the information underlying. As a given example, suppose you have the sunlight and you have a candlelight. You will probably not notice the candlelight because there is sunlight. So one of the immediate reaction would be that how we can minimize the effect of the sunlight if we are trying to look at the candlelight. And then if you can minimize the effect of the sunlight, automatically the only thing that will be remaining is the candlelight. Similar things are happening in the name of statistical significance. Because in a natural data, we tend to look at things that are statistically significant, but often critical problem like detection of early Alzheimer, detection of early cancer, are almost always belong to the space of statistically insignificant pieces of information, which are more often than not discarded because we just don't find meaning to it. The process of discarding should be extremely careful. We really need to make sure that this is not related to the contextualized discussion that we're talking about like a cancer detection or Alzheimer's detection. So our method relies on extremely sophisticated model building that does not kill the underlying information. In summary, it's a heavy computationally intense process. That's why you're building a whole cloud stack and infrastructure around it because it's not an easy process. It's literally like mining a piece of diamond from a diamond mine. You just don't see and shining in a diamond mine you have to extract the diamond from the diamond mine, which is hidden under the coal. So this is precisely the process and it's uh, infrastructure heavy, it's computation heavy, but somebody has to pay the price. The end result is beautiful because you are precisely looking at the kind of information for that particular context. I'm reminded of Nassim Taleb and the long tail. It is not just the data within the Six Sigma, there's the little minute signals that often we miss out. If you look at information theory, like Shannon's entropy and information, the information is always related to the entropy or the uncertainty around it. It's, it's very counterintuitive. Often we think the uncertain part is garbage and we throw it away. What we found out that in the uncertain part, there are hidden patterns and which are very definitive, but for that you need extensive model building that what is the best pattern that can be mapped from these apparently random pieces of information. It's literally like a sewing a beautiful dress from like a thread and that's a non-trivial process. It's, it's literally like a crafting and curating process, very iterative and you have to constantly have feedback of where it is going. But once you get it, you won't believe that the kind of pattern you see from the apparently noisy pieces of data. To me, it's very exciting because when everybody says this is just a piece of garbage and I am able to extract the structure underlying and we of course double check whether or not it is correct. And then more often than not, we see something beautiful coming out of the natural reality of garbage data. Taking me back to the first 
course I took on information theory and coding theory, the value of any particular piece of information is inversely proportional to the log of how often it occurs. The P log P. Yes, the, the P log P. Yes, exactly. So but, the rare things are so important. Oh yeah, you see that when P is one, that means if something with certainty, there is no information, the value is zero. And I, I think this was my own wake up call that we should really look in the piece of dirt in terms of the data, because that's where the information is. And, and literally the Talibs, like the fat and the non-Gaussian behavior of it, there is a lot more going on. It's very, very interesting. Now, why people did not look at it carefully, mainly because the computation is very heavy. It's a very heavy infrastructure, intense process. That's why I'm going a little slowly, but steadily that we need to build a whole new architecture I build called SIP, SIPP, which is Scalable Image Processing Platform. I had to come up with an architecture in order to address those nuances of heavy computation to find out the patterns that are underlying but not apparently visible. Do you think in our lifetime we'll be able to detect or estimate the likelihood of earthquake more precisely with these kinds of technologies? That's an excellent question. And that's a part of my collaboration effort with many academics, but I must mention uh, my dear colleague at IIT Kharagpur, uh, Dr. Amardeep Ghosh in, the, in his propulsion lab. Earthquake is kind of a buildup of energy and stress within a geological environment. And one fine morning, we see the eruptions, but as a physics student, we know that it built up over a long period of time, just like the whistle of a pressure cooker. We see when the whistle blows off but the buildup has been there for a while. Now that's the precise reason I'm doing something called like small signal. Small signal means that tiny buildups are not very easy to measure, but they build up over a long period of time. If we can detect that building up process and kind of detect the threshold where it will blow up, I won't say that we can know exactly when it is going to happen, but these are probabilistic events. If our probability of happening that event is extremely accurate, then we know when to take action. I believe personally that that is possible that we'll know better than ever, given the data, the whole buildup process of earthquake or rare phenomena and crack protection. We're doing that for real with many systems that we are studying right now, both through my academic collaboration and industrial collaborations. It is an opportunity to invite those who are interested in applying small signal and noisy pattern to detect those rare phenomenology. My open invitation, please contact me so that we can explore that with extremely curious and open mind. But from the preliminary evidence I am seeing, it is highly possible, better than ever before. I can see applications in areas like functional safety, little parts of your car that get older over time. And how mm -hmm. do you make sure when it's likely to die? Yes. You don't want to see that your tire is punctured at 60 miles per hour. Same thing with healthcare. I guess you have been working in multiple verticals or collaborating, is that correct? The ramification of this uh, noise clarity leads into pretty much every field of science and engineering and human consciousness. But on the other hand, I'm still solving one problem, which is how to reliably extract information from raw data. So in a way, I'm solving just one problem. The differences are in the details and the application level. One paper got accepted on cardiac flow in nature. You'll see that like coming in the coming months. And then where we have shown that from almost no pattern from raw cardiac flow data using MRI are now extremely clearly visible. We are able to see patterns that was always there, but we just could not touch upon it because it was not perceivable. It was visible, it was not perceivable. And if we extrapolate that to every possible areas of science, I think a whole new revolution of scientific discovery would happen. That doesn't mean we have to put in new sensors, but based on already data available. It reminds me of the ink blot chart used in psychology where mm -hmm. we don't see things until we express ourselves. So speaking of mental health, we often tend to be in our own eco chambers. I want to hear things that I like. I want to only talk to people I agree with. Is it possible that some of these techniques can be used in mental health and understanding how to open our mind to see things multidimensionally? Or do you foresee these kinds of applications as well? That's a beautiful question. It's a difficult question. Again, I still have my uh, physicist's hat. Uh, so I would uh, try to uh, answer from an objective perspective. 
So mind cannot be very different from the systems that is in place to create the mind, to create the thought pattern, to create beautiful or ugly imagination that is happening in our brain. It's some quantum physical mechanical reaction that is happening as a result of which we can imagine things. I would say the crude verticals of mental health, let's say anxiety, stress, and depression. I personally believe that just like beautiful music has harmonics and they are all like an orchestra, they're all playing the same song with different instrument in their own way, but while connected to the bigger reality of the orchestra, making one piece of music together. This is my personal experience and I'm just sharing that rather than preaching anything. We cannot be very isolated as an individual from the entire cosmos. And we know in math, the law of small number and law of large number. The law of large number almost always has a less fluctuations. And law of small number always has higher standard deviation or fluctuations. Using that analogy, the bigger our connectivity to the rest of the universe than our individual self will make us go towards the law of large number, which means there is more stability and resilience. Again, this is the math theorem. This is no philosophy. We see that almost all physical systems where there is a macroscopic magnanimity, there is stability, there is happiness, there is predictability. So if we find out a way, a scientifically sensible way that can connect us beyond ourselves, I think a majority of the mental health problem can be solved. And one of the problem is that with mental health, we often cannot express what is happening because often we have been taught to talk only in the vocal languages, but we need to develop a new kind of language where it is beyond our vocal language and all the traditional languages that we speak in, the language of love, compassion, and being generous to ourselves as well as the rest of the world. These are the new kind of tools we should be developing both in the academic institution and within our society so that we have a more human way of expressing ourselves. And if we cannot, we are all trying to express in all different ways. The problem is the doors are not always open. We are afraid to be judged. We are afraid to be kind of dampened down by the norms of the society. A little more openness will at least have us the way to express and then connect to the bigger reality. And this is exactly where I'm collaborating with my neurotechnological collaborators. One of them is Mr. Devon White, who is a great buddy and collaborator of mine. With his company Field, we are building like the next generation of neurotechnology so that the sensors will help us to get a test of our own mind, which we never thought of because we almost always ignore that as insignificant signal. But this is science. We are not talking about philosophy. This is real science and that will help us expand in our mental space. Knowledge is almost always good once we know something. Generally, anxiety comes about unknown situations, about things, what is going to happen with me. If we have the light of that knowledge through actual measurements and technology, then I believe that this can be mitigated, if not completely removed. This is amazing that you are able to show a mirror of the mind. There's reality out there and there is the mind that's capturing a small fragment of that reality. And if we can have a mirror that shows this is what you saw, this is what is in your mind, and then you start bringing them together, it can be magical. Yes, it is not philosophy anymore and not only just seeing that as like a, a prognosis or diagnosis of something, but also the intervention of the ability to connect. There is a deep thing about connection. If you look at like individual nerve cells that people, the biologists do experiment on, if they keep them in a petri dish, they're always trying to look connections amongst each other. This is a fundamental law of nature studied by many scientists across generations. So that connection building and the whole rise of social media points to something that we don't want to be isolated. We want that bigger and deeper connections building, except the social media by itself is the shallow version of it. The next generation of social media would be the meaningful connection building, not only with the human, but also with the plants, with the river, with the stars, with pretty much everything we can think of in our cosmic reality. Because even a single atom in this universe cannot exist 
without everything else collaborating for that existence. So this is why I think we think only the statistically significant part of our existence is important. We have to take things in our entirety and how it connects to mental health and depression and everything, because we often try to remain in our isolated space and thinking that, oh, nobody's caring about us. I think we have to be proactive about connecting to the rest of the cosmic reality, both human connection and non-human connection. Again, it's a fundamental reality that has been proven by many generations of biologists. And I think technology can help us to open up that dimension and have our mental mirror and the correction building mechanism in a very seamless and scientific way. I learned something amazing in very simple words. You described macroscopic magnanimity and these are the things that are being researched now at the Stanford Center for Compassion and Altruism Research to look at how understanding the role of mindfulness, the role of caring for others, the role of connecting with others, the role of caring for oneself and the other is going to change the way we live our lives and result in greater, much more meaningful mental health. Same thing at the Greater Good Science Center at uh, UC Berkeley. And there are centers like that around the world at Yale, as well as at many religious institutions. So thank you, Prasanta, for opening my mind that it is possible now to get these micro measurements of how we are deviating from the macroscopic magnanimity. And it's not all about diseases. Let's kind of breathe in and see that there's a possibility of connection rather than the anxiety of looking good or, oh my God, I'll be judged. Let's find ways to connect with each other. So thanks again. And to everybody out there, this is why I talk to people because I learn things and understand things in a nuanced way from different angles. Please come forward. I want to know your story as well. And maybe you can contribute to co-creating a universe that's more meaningful than it has ever been. Thanks again, Prasanta. Thank you, Shankar, for this beautiful opportunity to talk to you and your wonderful audience.